Hi there, my name is Anne and I am with the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center or TURC for short. And today you'll be joining me for a field trip, a virtual field trip about the formation of Lake Tahoe. This field trip is going to go through a number of different geologic concepts that will lead us into understanding how these forces that are happening on our planet come to form the beautiful, beautiful Lake Tahoe Basin and Lake Tahoe. So we're gonna dive right in to our field trip together so in most times we get to be together in the Tahoe Science Center, which is located in Incline Village, Nevada. However, because of COVID-19, we're adapting our field trip programming to come to you wherever you may be in the world so that you can continue to learn about Lake Tahoe through our lesson together. Like I said, we're gonna be covering a lot of things that help us understand what's happening right here in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Starting off our field trip, we're gonna jump right in to talking about the layers of our earth. So we have four layers of our earth that geologists have named, and we're gonna go through each layer one at a time so that we can understand one, the name of the layer, but also whether that layer is a solid or a liquid, because whether that layer is a solid or a liquid actually will help us understand why those layers are behaving in certain ways. So the first layer of our earth that we're going to give a name to is the outermost layer of our earth. Just by looking at our model here, you can see that it's really, really thin in comparison to those other layers. Does anyone know the name of this layer? I'll give you a second to see if you can come up with it. If you said crust, you were correct. The crust, which is our outermost layer, is really thin and it's actually pretty brittle. And relative to the other layers of our earth, it's considered to be very cold. It has a lot of variability in its thickness. It can be 3.1 miles thick in some places, but can, it can also be as thick as 43.5 miles thick. If you think about, if you swim to the bottom of the ocean, there's still rock at the bottom of our ocean and that's part of our crust. And that's where you can get those thin parts of the crust. But if you were standing on top of Mount Everest and had to go all the way through the crust to get to the next layer of our earth, that's where you might see places that are much, much thicker. But that crust is actually broken up into many, many pieces. And we're gonna to get to investigate those pieces together and how they might interact with each other. But those pieces can also be called tectonic plates. So if you hear me say crust, or if you hear me say tectonic plates, we as geologists like to use those terms pretty interchangeably, even though they have some slight differences to them, for the most part, they mean the same thing. And with our crust, like I was saying, there's rock at the bottom of the ocean. If you go through all the water at the bottom of our ocean, there's crust underneath the ocean. And we call that oceanic crust. While the continents mostly uh, that we get to walk on are called continental crust. So we're gonna also investigate those terms and what those mean when two plates interact with each other. But before I get ahead of myself, let's move on to the next layer of our earth, which is this red layer. Does anyone know the name of this layer of our earth? Right, it's the mantle. So the mantle of our earth is probably the trickiest part, the trickiest of all the layers of our earth because it's a solid, but it can also behave like a liquid. And this is a really, really neat part of our mantle that drives a lot of different geologic processes happening all over the earth and actually drives some of the movement in the crust. So when we're talking about the mantle, it's really, really thick. It can be 1,800 miles thick. Not only is it really thick, but it's also really hot in comparison to our crust. We were talking about that crust being thin and brittle and cold, but our mantle at the top of our mantle near our crust is about 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you get closer to this next layer of earth that we're gonna give a name to, it gets much, much hotter up to 6,300 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot. I don't know what temperatures you all have experienced. The hottest day that I think I've ever experienced is maybe 120 degrees. So to see something that's 6,300 degrees Fahrenheit, I cannot even imagine how hot that would be. But because of that heat that's in our earth, 
that heat actually can cause movement in our mantle. And we're gonna to investigate together how that actually happens through a couple different lab experiments. That mantle, that's a solid that can behave like a liquid, isn't a liquid like water. It would be a liquid that's kind of like honey or maybe molasses or something that's really, really thick. And geologists sometimes call this a plastic mantle. So if you think if plastic melted and was moving, whatever movement is happening in the mantle that we're going to explore is happening very slowly. So keep in mind as we move forward, the mantle is a solid, but it can act like a liquid. Moving on to our next layer of our earth, does anyone know the name of this layer? This light yellow part here. This layer is called the outer core and the outer core of our earth is a liquid, a true liquid. The outer core is really, really hot, but the outer core is even hotter than the mantle. The outer core at its deepest part can reach temperatures near 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And all of that heat is actually come, coming from the metals that make up the core of our earth breaking down or decomposing. And as those metals decompose, they release heat energy. But because this layer of our earth is so hot, it melts all of those metals into a liquid. And that's why the outer core is a liquid. Another fun fact about our outer core is actually those metals breaking down over time is what creates the magnetic field of our earth. So when you use a compass and it points north, that's the magnetic field that's being generated by the outer core of our earth from the inside that's creating uh, the pull on your compass that tells you which way is north. Pretty cool, right? But that's not as relevant to our formation of Lake Tahoe. Just a fun fact I wanted to share with you all. Moving on to our last layer of our earth that we haven't given a name to yet is this centermost part. Does anyone want to take a guess? Maybe you have a good idea since we have an outer core. It's the inner core. So the inner core of our earth, just like our mantle and outer core is also really, really hot. It can reach temperatures near 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So of all the layers, it is the hottest of all the layers of our earth. It's mostly made up of iron and nickel, which are both metals. And if you draw a line from where the outer core ends to the center of our earth, you would have to travel about 785 miles. So it's pretty thick as well. Not as thick as our mantle and not quite as thick as our outer core, but our inner core is also really thick. But our inner core, even though it's really, really hot because we have so many other layers of our earth on that inner core, it's under an immense amount of pressure. And that pressure causes our inner core to be a solid. So as we think about the layers of our earth, it can be hard to wrap our head around how thick these layers really are. I wanna compare the layers of our earth to something that you all may be more familiar with. Have any of you ever had a hard boiled egg before? If you think about the thickness of the different layers of a hard boiled egg in relation to the layers of the earth, they're pretty comparable. If you hard boil that egg, the shell, which is really, really thin and brittle and can break up pretty easily, is a lot like the crust of our earth. If you take that shell off, then you can see the white. And inside the white is that yolk. So the next time you eat a hard boiled egg, you can think about it and peel off the crust, eat through the mantle and get to enjoy the core of your earth. As we carry this base knowledge forward with us into the rest of our lesson, I wanna make sure that we're remembering whether those layers are solid or liquid. So we're gonna test our knowledge just by going through layer by layer and reminding ourselves whether the earth's layer that we're talking about is an A solid or B liquid. So the first layer of the earth that we're going to remind ourselves and test our knowledge on is the crust. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about whether that layer that I'm referring to is an A solid or B liquid. And if you need more time to think of the answer, you can always pause the video. So our first quiz question, is the Earth's crust an A solid or B liquid? Okay. 
if you said solid, you were right. Just like we were talking about, the outermost layer of our Earth where we walk is a solid. It's made of rock, a lot of different kinds of rock, and we get to walk all over it. So it's maybe the easiest layer to know that that is in fact a solid. Our next layer is our mantle. This was the one that was kind of tricky and that we're gonna get to explore further together. But is the Earth's mantle an A solid or B liquid? It's a solid, but remember, it's a solid that can behave like a liquid. So it's tricky. The liquid that's kind of like honey or molasses that geologists call the plastic mantle. Moving on to our next layer, the outer core. Do you all remember, is the Earth's outer core an A solid or B liquid? The Earth's outer core is a liquid. Remember, that outer core is really, really hot, just like the mantle and the inner core. They're both really hot. But the outer core is hot enough to actually melt the metals that make it up. So the outer core is a liquid. Moving on to our last layer, do you think the Earth's inner core is an A solid or B liquid? This may have also been a trick, but the Earth's inner core is a solid. Though the inner core is really, really hot also, you might think it would be a liquid because it could melt the metals that make up the inner core. But in fact, it's a solid because it's under so much pressure from all the other layers of our Earth. So now that we've spent time familiarizing ourselves with the names of the different layers of our Earth, we want to understand how these layers interact with each other and why they might even be interacting with each other. Something that comes into play with the layers of our earth is this concept called density. And it actually comes into play in a lot more ways in our life than just with our earth. Density by definition is the measurement of the amount of matter an object has compared to its volume. So matter is kind of like stuff. Everything is made up of molecules. I'm made up of molecules, you're made up of molecules, this desk I'm sitting at is made up of molecules. So it's a measurement of the amount of molecules, or if we just call it stuff, packed into an object relative or compared to its volume, which is its size. Mathematicians and scientists can actually calculate this with an equation. We're not gonna be calculating this and we're not gonna be using the equation, but I thought it'd be really important for you all to see this equation where mass is actually how scientists measure the number of molecules in something. And when you divide that by its volume, you can get your density of something. So if we look at two objects that have the same volume, these blue boxes here, they have the exact same volume. But if each of these green balls inside represented a molecule, one has more molecules packed into it than another. I'm going to pass it off to our friend Tim to help explain density a little bit more and to show you some neat examples of density and how you can test density of objects right in your own home even. Hi, I'm Tim. and Today we're going to talk about density. And we're going to talk about density in relationship to mass and volume. Because if you ask a scientist, they're going to just tell you that density is mass over volume. That's the formula. But we're going to do some experiments that's going to explain that a little better. So mass is the amount of matter in an object. Volume is the amount of space an object takes up in three dimensions. And density is how tightly stuff or the molecules are packed in a defined space. Everything is made up of molecules. I'm made of molecules, you're made of molecules, this container's made of molecules, water, H2O is molecules. So all things are made up of molecules. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some experiments to see which things have greater density, which of the molecules are more packed together. So we can look at this for an example. 
So starting over here with low density, moving over here to high density, we can see here's something that's only have five molecules in it. The same size, but five molecules. And as you move forward here, the density increases, and so some things have a tremendous amount of molecules, and so those things are more dense. So the experiments today are going to help prove that. So I have two objects here, which are the same size in volume, but one is clear and one is cloudy. So they're made of different materials. So what we want to do is to see which one is going to float and which is going to sink. And that's going to determine is one have greater density than water or one has less density of water because the density determines whether it floats or sinks. We'll put them in. We can see the clear one obviously had more density and the cloudy one floats. So there's a difference there. So let's take two other more common objects that you may even have in your house. So here we have a golf ball and a ping pong ball, which are awful close to the same size. But one will be more dense than the other. Which do you think? What is your hypothesis or your best guess as to which one might float and which might sink? Have something in mind? Okay, let's see. So the golf ball sank right away, and the ping pong ball floats. The ping pong ball is less dense because inside is air. And so the density is much less, there's much fewer molecules with that than there is with the golf ball. Here's a couple other common objects that you may have in the house. Here we have a potato and a tangerine. Now these are about the same size, so the volume is very similar but I'll bet the density might be different. So if we put these in, which do you think is going to be more dense? Which will sink and which will float? Maybe they'll both float, maybe they'll both sink. What's your hypothesis? Have it in mind? Let's see. Aha, the tangerine floated and the potato sank. Why do you suppose that is? As we mentioned earlier, the potato must have more dense molecules than the tangerine. So let's take a look inside. Hold these up and we look at these. You can see the density of the molecules in the potato are really tight together. There's no space in there. When we look at the tangerine, look at the spacing between there. You can see that there's some air and, and space that is not molecules. So the density of the potato, even though they were relatively the same size, is much greater. And so therefore that sank and the tangerine floated. So we have a couple other household objects you may have. So here we've got two things of identical size and they also contain 12 ounces. So the volume is the same, identical size cans, unopened, and they're both 12 ounces which are clearly labeled on the can. But the difference between them, this is a regular Coca-Cola and this is a diet Dr. Pepper. So if we put these in, which do you think is going to happen? Shouldn't we get the same results? What do you think? What's your hypothesis or best guess? Got something in mind? Here we go. What we see there is the Coca-Cola sank and the Dr. Pepper's floating. Why do you suppose that's happening? Since they're both 12 ounces and they're both the same size. The main difference between the two is the fact that the Coke has between 30 and 40 grams of sugar in it and the Diet Coke, Diet Dr. Pepper is artificial sweet, which has far fewer molecules in it than the sugar. The sugar takes up the space between the liquids and makes it heavier. So that, therefore, that's why the diet floats and the full sugar one sinks. All right, I've done some experiments here using some objects we had. 
What I want you to do is I want you to go in your home and find some things of similar volume that you can do this experiment in water. So I want you to have things that are okay to put in water and you may have some, maybe you want some supervision from your parents. But I want you to do this experiment and see which things of similar volume will have greater density. And now I'm gonna send you back to Ann. Thanks so much, Tim. So you just looked at a couple different examples of the comparison of two objects of the same volume and whether one was more or less dense than water. It was really neat to get to see the comparison between these two objects. And also, I mean, even getting to look inside a tangerine and a potato to see what it really means for something to have more molecules or more stuff packed into it. My favorite was definitely the Coke can versus the Diet Coke can. Pretty tricky, huh? But we're gonna keep talking about density as it relates to the layers of our earth. As I was talking about when we started our conversation around density, the crust of our earth is the least dense and the core, the centermost part of our earth is the most dense. So when we think about scientists or mathematicians calculating this to get an actual number, scientists have calculated the density of each of the layers of our earth. And when we look at the units here, just like if we were measuring something in centimeters or inches, there's units involved with density. So our units here, the G represents grams, that's the mass of something, and then our volume are cubic centimeters. So the inner core of our earth has a density roughly of 13 grams per cubic centimeter. That's really dense. While the crust of our earth it has some variability because we have different kinds of crust and those different kinds of crust actually have different densities. But the crust of our earth on average is 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter. The mantle of our earth has a density roughly of 4.6 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's important when we think about the relationship between our crust and our mantle. Just like if you think about the ping pong ball, wanting to stay floating on top of the water in our lab that we observed with Tim, the crust will want to stay floating on top of the mantle because things that are less dense will stay on top of things that are more dense. So as those two interact with each other, the crust will want to stay outside the mantle on top of the mantle. But that's not the only important relationship of density. Like I was just saying, our crust actually has variable density to it. So our crust, our continental crust is the least dense of our kinds of crust. And our oceanic crust, the one that you have to swim all the way to the bottom of the ocean to find, is our most dense crust. So scientists have calculated that our continental crust is about 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter, while our oceanic crust is 2.9 grams per cubic centimeter. So there's not a huge, huge difference between the two. But if those two layers of our crust are to interact with each other, our continental crust, being the least dense, will always float on top of our oceanic crust. I don't want that concept to be lost on us because we're gonna investigate it further together in a little bit as we begin to explore how tectonic plates interact with one another. But looking closely at this, if we have our oceanic crust, which is really, really dense, it's under so much pressure from all the water in our ocean on top of it. This shows that, as we were talking about, our oceanic crust is a lot thinner than our continental crust. If you remember the fun facts that I was sharing at the beginning about the crust, underneath our oceanic crust, or underneath the ocean rather, our oceanic crust can be as thin as 3.1 miles thick. While our continental crust that's made up of lighter materials can be as thick as 43.5 miles thick. So volume wise, our continental crust is much thicker than our oceanic crust, but our oceanic crust has a lot more molecules or a lot more stuff packed into it. And that's what makes it more dense than our continental crust. But what if I told you there is something else that can affect density? Temperature can also affect density. And we're going to explore this in another lab. So we're going to have two different systems set up. We're going to have 
two jars, one on top of the other. And in both of our systems, we're going to have yellow warm water and cold blue water. In one situation, we're going to have the jar with warm water on top and cold water on bottom. And starting off our experiment, there'll be a note card between these two jars separating the water. When you see this situation in the video that we're going to show you, I want you all to think about what will happen when the warm bottle is on top of the cold bottle and the note card is removed from between those two bottles. The second system we're going to look at is with cold water on top of warm water with a note card between. With that system, I also want you to take a second to make a hypothesis or a prediction as to what you think will happen when that note card is removed. Maybe you can pause the video after you watch the first system go and you can take some time to think through what might be happening here. Okay, this is an activity that you can do at home. I have very cold blue water and I'm gonna fill these jars. Baby food jars work great if you have baby food jars. I'm gonna fill two uh, of them with the very cold blue water and I'm going to fill oops, two of them with the hot yellow water. And just be careful you don't burn yourself. Okay, and what I want to do is I'm going to put this, this is just an index card, and I'm going to put the index card on top of, uh, so in this case, I'm going to put the blue cold water on top of the yellow hot water. And in this case, I'm going to put the yellow hot water on top of the blue cold water. Okay, and to start out with, I'm going to take apart, take out this divider. See if I can. And let's see what happens. What do you predict might happen? Can you see how the yellow warm water stayed on top of the cold water? What do you think will happen if I do it the other way around? with the cold water on top. Uh -oh. That thing got too wet. So what's happened here is this water is less dense and so it stays on top of the cold, more dense water. In this case, the water was more dense on the top and so it flowed down into the other. So you can try this at home for yourself to see that warm water is in fact less dense than cold water. We've been talking about density and I was mentioning how temperature is something else that can affect density. In this situation, warm water is less dense than cold water. And just as we've been discussing with the layers of our earth, whether it be the crust or even looking at our examples of a ping pong ball and a golf ball, something that was less dense than water wanted to float on top of it. So our warm water is less dense than our cold water. When looking at system one, the warm water that's less dense is already floating on top of the cold water. So when that note card gets removed between the two jars, the warm water is already where it wants to be, on top of the more dense cold water. Whereas in our second system, the warm water starts out on the bottom and our cold water started out on the top. When that note card was removed, the cold water immediately wanted to sink and that warm water wanted to get where it could be floating on top of the cold water. But because those waters were trading places, we got to see them actually blend colors and create a green. But what was really happening is the warm water was trying to rise and float on top of our more dense cold water. But why would understanding how temperature affects density be important with the earth and the layers of earth? Because that's what we've been talking about so far. As we remember, when discussing the layers of our earth, the innermost part of our earth is really, really hot. We were talking about how the inner core can reach temperatures near 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But the outermost part of our earth, our crust, is pretty cold. So 
with this temperature gradient, as scientists call it, meaning as you go down or deeper into our earth, it gets hotter, we can see a system created kind of like our cold water on top and our hot water on bottom. Within our earth, the center of our earth is actually heating the other layers around it. So the outer core and the inner core, if I just combine them to call them the core of our earth, are heating up the mantle. And it's like creating warm water on the bottom. So as the mantle is heated up, just like our warm water on the bottom wanted to rise and take the place of the cold blue water, our heated up mantle will rise. But because the heat that is heating up the mantle is coming from the core of our earth, as that mantle rises and moves away from its heat source, it cools down. In our diagram here, we can see red represents hot and blue represents cold. So our mantle gets heated up and rises. And as it moves away from its heat source, it cools down and it sinks. It becomes more dense again and sinks. And like I was saying that the mantle is a solid that can behave like a liquid. This is the behavior of the liquid. The movement in the mantle because of the heat is just like our second water system with our yellow warm water on the bottom and our cold blue water on the top. But it's happening constantly. We're not getting a one-time mix to show the green. This kind of movement in the mantle of our earth is constantly happening at a very, very slow rate. That's something that's really important with geology and understanding anything happening in geology. Geologic time is really, really slow. It's hard for us to see a lot of these things that are happening with our naked human eye because they happen so slowly over millions of years. So as we continue our conversation about these different forces, I want us to keep in mind that some of these things we may not be able to see. But going back to this movement in the mantle of our earth, this rising of the mantle because it's hot, it's becoming less dense as it gets heated up, and then it cools down and sinks as it becomes more dense, creates something called a convection cell, or what scientists in the mantle call convection currents. And if you know anything about currents, if you think about the ocean or maybe the surface of Lake Tahoe even, currents can move things around. So we're going to watch a short part of a video that shows us what these convection currents might look like. This is just a model, but I want you to make observations as we watch this short clip together so we can understand how these convection currents might be moving or creating some sort of geologic phenomenon somewhere else in our Earth. So now we're looking inside our Earth. What do you notice? I'm gonna pause the video here. So just like our diagram was showing us, this large plume of heat that kind of looks like a mushroom cloud almost, or maybe like a volcano, is moving within the mantle of our earth. So this thin layer here, our crust, and then our mantle, and you can see our really, really molten hot, red hot core of our earth. So as our core heats up the mantle, you can see it's rising. And as it moves away from that heat source, as it hits the crust of our earth, it becomes colder and more dense and begins to sink down. Maybe you made some other observations about this short clip. And that takes us into are convection currents actually moving the tectonic plates that are the outermost layer of our Earth? If you remember, the crust and the tectonic plates are the same thing. So I'm gonna to refer to the crust of our Earth as tectonic plates 
from here on out. But as we move into talking about those tectonic plates and how they interact with each other, our takeaway from this is that those convection currents in our mantle, that circular movement is actually what's driving those tectonic plates to move. So our crust is broken up into a lot of different pieces and all of those pieces are separate tectonic plates. And this map here actually shows us all the tectonic plates on our crust right now that make up our crust. If you look closely here, this brown plate is actually the North American plate. And this continent here is North America where we are, unless you're joining me from somewhere else in the world. But if you're in the Lake Tahoe area, you're roughly right about here on our North American plate. And this map shows us tons of red arrows of ways that those tectonic plates are interacting with each other. And what scientists or geologists call the way that tectonic plates interact with each other are tectonic plate boundaries. There are three types of tectonic plate boundaries, convergent, divergent, and transform. But we're gonna go deeper into what each of these tectonic plate boundaries actually looks like and what might happen when that tectonic plate boundary is occurring. The first plate boundary that we're going to look at together is the convergent plate boundary. So I want us all to use our hands and pretend that they're tectonic plates. And we're going to move our hands in various ways to help us understand the movement of tectonic plates and what these interactions might be showing us or creating on our earth. So like I said, the first plate boundary that we're going to go through is our convergent plate boundary. And our convergent plate boundary is two plates coming together. I like to remember it because convergent starts with a C and coming together starts with a C. So as I move my hands and as you move your hands along with me, I want you to make observations about what you think might be happening. You can reset your hands and do it several times so that maybe you're observing different things happening each time you do it. Ready, set, go. What do you observe? Now that you've done that a couple times, maybe you've seen that there's many different ways that your hands as tectonic plates can come together. And just as your hands have many ways of coming together, actual plates have many ways of coming together in this convergent plate boundary. Maybe you observe that sometimes your fingers went up or at other times, maybe you notice one hand went over another. Or maybe you notice that there was a lot of pressure between your hands as you brought them together. Maybe you observe something completely different. Going back to our slides, we can look at some diagrams to help us understand how convergent plate boundaries interact in a couple different ways. When we watch that video of the convection currents in our mantle moving the crust of our earth or the tectonic plates, we could see in that right part of our video where one plate was going under another, this is an example of a convergent plate boundary, those two plates coming together. But our convergent plate boundary is probably the most complicated of the three of our plate boundaries because we have two kinds of tectonic plates. We have oceanic plates and continental plates. And because we have those two types of plates, we can have two ocean plates come together. We can have an oceanic and a continental plate come together or we could have two continental plates coming together. And in those three interactions, we can see sort of similar things happen, but also some different things happening. So we're going to look at each of those independently. Our first convergent plate boundary we're going to look at is our continental continental interaction. So where two continental plates are coming together. And as we were talking about density, two continental plates would have probably roughly the same density. So when they come together, you can see things. And if we look at our hands coming together, it's probably gonna look most like this, where those two plates, one is not 
less dense and going to float on top of the other. Those two are just going to kind of ram together like a head-on collision. And when those two plates come together, those two continental plates, you can get really, really big mountains. And a great example of this in the world are the Himalayan mountains. The next type of convergent plate boundary is when two oceanic plates come together. So our oceanic plates actually have some variable density to them because of the age of the rock. So when two oceanic plates come together, the older, more dense rock will sink beneath the younger, less dense rock. And this process, when one plate goes under another, is called subduction. And our oceanic oceanic plate convergence actually creates really, really deep ocean trenches. Do any of you know the name of the deepest trench on Earth? The Marianas Trench, right. So this is a picture of the top of the Marianas Trench. And if you compare the Marianas Trench, this super, super deep ocean trench, to Mount Everest, if you were to flip Mount Everest upside down, Mount Everest is 29,029 feet tall. But from the surface of our ocean to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, it's 36,070 feet. So the Marianas Trench is actually deeper than Mount Everest is tall. And this oceanic, oceanic uh, plate, these two plates coming together is creating that really, really deep ocean trench. Our third kind of convergent plate boundary, and the one that applies most to the formation of Lake Tahoe, is our oceanic continental convergence. So when you have one plate, our oceanic plate, come toward our continental plate, you have another instance of subduction, where one plate goes under the other plate. Does anyone know which plate would go under the other plate? Right, our oceanic plate would go under our continental plate because that oceanic plate is more dense and our continental plate is less dense. But when you have one plate subduct, you can create a lot of pressure in our mantle that forces magma up through the earth and this magma will erupt out of a volcano and can create mountains also. And this is how the Sierra Nevada mountains have formed, which are the west side of Lake Tahoe. And this is a view from the east shore of Lake Tahoe across to those beautiful big Sierra Nevada mountains. That's our convergent plate boundary. Kind of complicated because we have different kinds of crust that can interact in different ways based on their density. But the most important one to remember is this last one, where a continental plate and an oceanic plate meet and that oceanic plate subducts under the continental plate and it can create mountains. The next tectonic plate boundary that we're going to use our hands to make observations about is our divergent plate boundary. Our divergent plate boundary, I like to remember it starts with a D and our plates are dividing or pulling away from each other. So I want you to make observations and this one's a little bit trickier to make observations about, but what do you notice when you divide your hands when you have them starting together and they pull apart or divide from one another in our divergent plate boundary. You can reset and make observations again and do this a couple times. So what did you notice going on here? What observations are you making when we have our divergent plate boundary? I noticed that there was space made between my hands as this pulled apart. And since our tectonic plates and our crust are the same, I'm kind of curious and I'm wondering what would happen when two plates pull apart? Because if this is making up the outermost layer of our earth, it seems like the space that's created might be exposing something beneath it. But what could that be exposing? Let's look back at our diagrams to help us understand our divergent plate boundary. When we watched the video of the convection currents in our mantle, we saw that big plume. And on the surface of our earth, we saw these two plates moving away from each other. And there's this small opening between those two plates. So with our divergent plate boundary and those plates dividing, they actually expose the mantle. 
And just like a volcano, when that magma can come up through the earth or through this crack in the crust, it'll come out and it'll cool and becomes new rock. And that new rock is actually creating new crust of our earth at our divergent plate boundary. Through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the ocean floor is actually spreading apart. It's a divergent plate boundary. And as it spreads and this magma can come up and create new crust, it's actually creating this, what they call, what scientists call the mid-Atlantic ridge. If you look at a map of the depth of our ocean, you can see throughout the entire Atlantic Ocean, there's this elevated ridge forming where these plates are pulling apart from one another. Through our mid-Atlantic ridge though, there's a couple islands and one of those islands is actually Iceland. And as the mid-Atlantic ridge cuts through Iceland where those plates are pulling apart, you can actually see this if you were to visit Iceland. You can actually see where one plate is on one side and another plate is on the other side and those two plates are pulling apart. Our last plate boundary we're gonna look at together is our transform plate boundary. And we're gonna to refer to our tectonic plate hands again to help us understand what might be happening in this tectonic plate boundary. Instead of having our hands flat, we're actually gonna make two fists and we're gonna ram our knuckles together. And just like you saw those arrows moving, we're gonna to try to slide these tectonic plates next to each other. I want you to do this a couple times as well and really see what this is taking or what's happening as you do this motion. What do you observe in this situation? You can reset and do that transform plate boundary as many times as you want, but I want you to think about what observations you're making. I'm observing that it's really, really hard to force my knuckles to move from one to the next. It's taking a lot of pressure to create any sort of movement. And when that movement happens, it's a really, really big movement, it seems like. Kind of hurts my knuckles a little bit. And then even in a couple times when I did it, there was a really big release where my hands came apart from each other completely. After making our observations here, we can go back and look at our diagrams again to break down our transform plate boundary. So as we were making observations about what happened when we tried to slide our knuckles alongside each other, we noticed that it took a lot of force to get that movement to occur. And when the movement along my knuckles did happen, it was a jolting motion. It was pretty forceful. Does that remind you of anything? What kind of geologic event do you think might be occurring along this transform plate boundary? We'll come back to that in a second. But have any of you ever heard of the San Andreas Fault? Maybe if you're joining us from the Lake Tahoe area, you've even gotten to visit the San Andreas Fault before. This is the, one of the world's most famous transform plate boundaries. And it's really famous because it runs through an area where a lot of people live. So maybe some of you have gotten to visit the San Andreas Fault before, and this is actually a picture of the San Andreas Fault from a plane as it runs through Southern California. So there are places right on our continent where you can go and actually see this transform fault itself. Going back to our question about what that geologic event might remind you of, what that creates a big release of energy. Have any of you ever experienced an earthquake before? Our San Andreas Fault is so famous because some really, really big earthquakes have happened on it. And because there's a lot of people that live near it and earthquakes can create a lot of damage, it's something that people and geologists specifically wanna study and understand better. Our yellow star here shows us where we are in the Lake Tahoe area, roughly, in comparison to the San Andreas Fault. So in comparison to the rest of the North American continent, we're pretty close to the San Andreas Fault. And this movement along this transform boundary, this really unique boundary, is actually what drives a lot of the forces here in the Lake Tahoe area. Any sort of tectonic plate movement or these plate boundaries can create stretching and cracking 
elsewhere on the crust. And so all throughout California and other places around that San Andreas Fault actually can see cracking and spreading and the creation of other fault lines. But we'll come back to talking about fault lines as we get further into our lesson and as we talk more specifically about the formation of Lake Tahoe itself. Now that we've taken a bit of time to talk about these different tectonic plate boundary types, I want you to pause the video and go to the PDF and under the explain section, I want you to watch the video called Continental Drift 101. It's about a minute and 20 seconds long. After you've watched that video from our friends at National Geographic, I want you to come back here and we'll continue our lesson and our, continue our conversation about the formation of Lake Tahoe. You just watched that really neat video from National Geographic talking about the supercontinent called Pangaea. Many, many millions of years ago, Pangaea existed. It was that supercontinent combining all of our continents today together. But over time, as we've had convection currents in the mantle, moving the tectonic plates on the surface of our Earth, those continents have separated from one another. And as they've separated and moved away, they've moved into this configuration, much more like the right, that we know our Earth to look like today. This video helps us understand, as I was talking about before, that things that happen on a geologic timescale happen over millions of years. They happen really, really slowly. The formation of Lake Tahoe has happened over a really, really long time period. And it's actually one of the oldest lakes in the world. Now that you all have a really strong understanding of tectonic plates and their boundaries and how they interact with each other, I want us to dive deeper into something that we were talking about with our transform plate boundary. I'm gonna show you all a simulation, a model that scientists at NOAA have created. And as I play the model for you all, I want you all to make observations. Scientists are all about making observations. They're using their different senses to get an understanding of what's happening. So as you watch the model, I want you all to write down, if you have a science journal with you, things that you notice. You can write those sentences by starting even with the words, I notice. Maybe, for example, I notice that the sky is blue. Scientists also are really driven by understanding things by asking questions. You can maybe write down some questions that you have by saying, I wonder blank. I wonder why the sky is blue. Something else that helps us in science in making observations and drawing comparisons is understanding what it reminds us of or something else that we've seen before or can understand. So I also want you to write down anything that this model reminds you of by saying it reminds me of blank. For my example with the sky, maybe it reminds me of the ocean. All right, moving over to our model, I'm gonna start rotating our earth here, and then I'm gonna start playing our model. And remember, I just want you to make observations as we go through and watch this together, of things that you notice, what questions you're asking, what you're wondering about, and maybe even what this reminds you of. Maybe you recognize some of the continents on our earth here, As we're watching our model here, I'm just gonna stop the rotation for a second so that I can make us aware of where we are in the world. We're here on our North American continent and roughly on the West Coast, we're probably right about here where my cursor is. But I'm gonna keep rotating our Earth so you all can continue to make observations about what you think is happening.
All right, I'm gonna stop our rotation back here with our North American continent. And I'm gonna stop the video now. I'm gonna rotate our earth and bring us around so that we can get a good look at this area that has a lot of different colors and dots popping up. So maybe you observed that there were flashes showing all these different dots popping up. Maybe you noticed that each of these dots were different colors from one another. Maybe you noticed, or maybe you wondered why the dots were different sizes from each other. Maybe you wondered what these circles in the middle of the ocean that say magnitude and then have different numbers and different sizes associated with them mean. You probably had a lot more observations than just those, but our model here is actually showing us all the earthquakes that have happened on Earth between 2001 and 2015. Each of these dots represents a different earthquake that's taken place. And the color shows us how deep within the crust of our Earth that earthquake occurred at what scientists call the epicenter of an earthquake. This magnitude with the size of the circles shows us how strong that earthquake is. Maybe some of you have felt an earthquake before, but maybe some of you have felt a stronger earthquake than some others. Maybe you've experienced an earthquake, I hope not, but maybe you've ex experienced an earthquake that's caused a lot of damage. The magnitude of our earthquake actually is measured on something called the Richter scale. And as you get higher and higher on the Richter scale, the severity or strength of that earthquake is increasing exponentially. And so the size of our circle is helping us understand how big of an earthquake was occurring. But maybe you also noticed that it seems like a lot of these earthquakes are taking place in very specific places on our planet. They're not happening everywhere. You can see here that there's a massive part of our ocean that didn't experience any earthquakes between 2001 and 2015. But as you get down here into some of the South Pacific islands, as well as we have Australia here, and we get closer to the coast of the Asian continent, there's a lot more dots that represent our earthquakes popping up. Why do you think this might be? Why do you think some earthquakes might happen in one place in the world, but earthquakes might not ever happen elsewhere in the world? Our model showed us that earthquakes come in varying magnitude. And the way that geologists know this is by measuring earthquakes with something called a seismograph. Earthquake magnitude increases exponentially, meaning that a magnitude five earthquake multiplies in strength 10 times when it moves up to a magnitude six earthquake. So if you have a magnitude nine earthquake, it's a great, great release of energy and can create a lot of damage and is really destructive. Fortunately, there haven't been many magnitude nine earthquakes, but if we think back using our hands and our transform plate boundary movement, and we were talking about how a release of energy sometimes when we have movement along our transform boundary can be a small movement, but at other times can be a really, really big movement and a big jolt because a lot of energy is being released and a lot of pressure has been building up and is all released at the same time. When we're measuring the strength of earthquakes and the magnitude of earthquakes, we can think about that movement of maybe one knuckle that didn't take a lot of pressure as a smaller earthquake, maybe a magnitude five earthquake, while that large movement of energy moving a lot of knuckles would be something that's a more major earthquake, like a seven, eight, or even a magnitude nine earthquake. Now that we've watched the rotating model of earthquakes that have happened on our earth, I want us to watch another video. It's the same model, but instead of on a rotating earth, it's on a flat map. The difference is, is that this model will start actually in 1901 and go through the end of the 20th century, so the year 2000, and show us a different time scale.
But now that you know that each of these dots represents an earthquake, I want you all to see what other observations you maybe make about our model here. If you look at the bottom of our video here, you can see that we're starting at the beginning of the 1900s. And now this model actually shows us also that earthquake depth and the different colors, meaning how deep they are occurring within the crust of our earth. And just like the first model we looked at, the size of the dot is also representing the magnitude of the earthquake. How big of an earthquake happened at that point in time. Remember, as you're making observations, you can write down things that you're noticing, but also questions that are coming up for you. Maybe things that it reminds you of as well. So with our video paused here, now the map is showing us all earthquakes that have happened between 1901 and the year 2000. As you can see, there's a lot of earthquakes that have happened. There's a lot of red dots. A lot, the majority of earthquakes that happen are pretty shallow in the crust, but there are definitely deeper earthquakes occurring. There's a lot of small dots and every so often we see a few of these really big dots. Maybe this go around as well. When able to look at a map of everywhere in the earth at the same time, you can focus in on one area pretty easily. I'm gonna rewind the video for us to watch again and I want us to take a close look at the west coast of the North American continent. There's a lot of earthquakes that happen along this transform fault, the San Andreas Fault. By focusing in on this area, we can understand that there's a lot of earthquakes happening right where we are. And those earthquakes that are occurring are actually impacting the depth of Lake Tahoe. So now that I've rewound, let's watch closely at the west coast of the North American continent. We can see lots of small flashes popping up here. It doesn't seem like there's anything super, super big, but this whole area is almost white because there's so many earthquakes that have happened along our San Andreas Fault. Pretty cool, right? Returning to our map that shows all the earthquakes that have happened between 1901 and the year 2000 on the same map, what else did you notice? Maybe you started to see that it looked like these earthquakes were all happening kind of on a line. Definitely not a straight line, but a map that kind of looks like another map that we've been looking at together. I'm gonna to keep playing the rest of the video now so that we can see what those lines might actually be. We're gonna slowly identify some of the bigger earthquakes that have happened so as dots disappear, we're gonna see the bigger and bigger dots remaining on our map. But we're also gonna see some of these lines underneath revealed. Do they remind you of anything else that we've looked at? Maybe they remind you of that map of those tectonic plate boundaries that we looked at together. Each of these lines represents where those tectonic plates are either converging, diverging, 
or sliding alongside each other in that transform plate boundary. Our map of the tectonic plate boundaries is pretty unique. And when we look at where all those earthquakes are occurring on top of those lines, we can see that the majority of the earthquakes that are occurring, about 90% of all earthquakes that occur, occur on a tectonic plate boundary. However, we can also see some dots outside of those lines, not on a tectonic plate boundary. The other 10% of earthquakes that occur on Earth occur on a fault line that is outside of the plate boundary. We introduced this term fault line earlier in our conversation, but a fault line is a break or a fracture in the ground that occurs when the Earth's tectonic plates move or shift and are areas where earthquakes are likely to occur. So with this definition of a fault line, a place where earthquakes are likely to occur, our tectonic plate boundaries are definitely fault lines. But the movement of those tectonic plates and the boundaries has actually created stretching and cracking of the crust of our earth outside of our plate boundaries. These are other places where earthquakes are likely to occur. So all plate boundaries are fault lines. All plate boundaries are absolutely a place where an earthquake can occur, but not all fault lines are plate boundaries. And we can see that when we look where we are on the North American plate, we have our San Andreas Fault, which is our big transform plate boundary. But we here, right on this yellow star, we have some fault lines that are not a plate boundary right where we live in the Lake Tahoe Basin. So when we look at a map of California that shows all of the different fault lines in California, we can see that this big red line that runs almost down the west coast of North America is our San Andreas Fault. It's that plate boundary. But there's been lots of stretching and cracking and creation of fault lines outside of the San Andreas Fault. And using our yellow star here again, we can see roughly where we are on the map in the Lake Tahoe area. But we can also see that there are several faults that run through the Lake Tahoe Basin. And these are the fault lines that have actually helped to form Lake Tahoe. They have earthquakes occurring along them that have created a really deep basin that is filled in with water and created our big, beautiful lake. But how did these fault lines get here in the first place? If we think back to our convergent plate boundary, we were talking about that the convergent plate boundary can help us form mountains. Does anyone remember the name of the mountains that we were specifically thinking about with Lake Tahoe? The Sierra Nevada Mountains. So when we have two plates coming together, we're gonna to look at this diagram to help us understand how the Sierra Nevada mountains formed. We have our oceanic and our continental plate. And when our oceanic plate on the left here subducts under our continental plate, our North American plate, it creates immense pressure in the mantle of our earth. And when that pressure is created in the mantle, it forces magma up through the crust, it creates cracking in the crust, and can cause volcanic eruptions. And with that magma coming up out of the volcano and becoming lava, it can create mountain ranges. And it created the Sierra Nevada mountains themselves. Does anyone know what kind of rock makes up the majority of the Sierra Nevada mountains? Granite, right. Granite is a volcanic rock. And the granite that the Sierra Nevada are really, really iconic for can be seen all around the Lake Tahoe Basin. So when we're on the east shore of Lake Tahoe, we can look across the lake and see the big, beautiful Sierra Nevada mountains that have been created through our convergent plate boundary. That's only one part of the formation of the Lake Tahoe area. So on the west shore of Lake Tahoe, we have the Sierra Nevada mountains. And on the east shore of Lake Tahoe, we have our Carson Range. But zooming out a little bit, the Lake Tahoe Basin is in a really, really iconic geologic area of the world. It's in this area called Walker Lane. And Walker Lane's really famous because there's several fault lines in it that have a lot of earthquakes occur. And geologists love studying this area because of all of its tectonic activity. 
Walker Lane is a part of the greater Basin and Range province, which makes up the majority of Nevada. So we're looking at our map here, we can see tons of ranges and basins across the state of Nevada. A basin is a low-lying area. Maybe you've heard the term sink basin, or you can think of it like a bathtub. And a range means a mountain range. It's a high up area. And so in our Lake Tahoe area, we have areas around the lake of ranges. We have that Sierra Nevada mountain range and our Carson range. And then we have a basin, a low lying area that can capture all the water that drains into it. And that on top of being in Walker Lane, this area where there's a lot of tectonic activity going on has helped make Lake Tahoe really, really deep. So geologists, these study ranges and basins and the way that they move in relation to one another with those fault lines and the movement along our fault lines. When we zoom in on Lake Tahoe, we can see on our map here at the right, all of these different white lines that run through the lake represent different fault lines in our area. One major zone of several fault lines runs along the west shore of Lake Tahoe and it's called the Tahoe Sierra Frontal Fault Zone. It's not super important for you to remember the name, but this is the fault zone where movement occurred over 3 million years ago that started to create the really, really deep Lake Tahoe Basin. This movement along fault lines can be complex to understand, especially when it comes to understanding how a basin can drop and become a lower place and the ranges can rise up. In our Lake Tahoe Basin specifically, we only have a half basin. So we have one side that's dropping because if you look at the bottom of our diagram here, the Lake Tahoe Basin is made up of two fault blocks as geologists call them. So with these two blocks along our Tahoe Sierra frontal fault zone, or that I'm just going to call our fault zone, we have movement. We have one block sliding down the other block and that movement creates a deep basin. We can use our hands again to help us understand the movement of these fault blocks. If we make two fists again, the space between our knuckles represents our fault line. And if we have one fault block sliding down the other, the movement is down of one block, but then the other blocks are also tilting up. And that's what's causing those ranges to rise. I want you all to use your knuckles and that pretend fault line at home to help understand this movement that's created our Lake Tahoe Basin, but I'm actually going to use a couple pieces of paper to help us understand this even better. As we use our paper model, we're going to be doing the exact same motion, that downward motion and that tilting motion. So our two pieces of paper when brought together here actually show us where that fault line is. But I'm gonna turn them around because the other side is labeled to help us understand where those mountain ranges are rising and where that basin is dropping and falling. So if we start here with our fault line in the center where the two pieces of paper come together, and as we were doing with our knuckles, we had that downward sliding motion, but then at the same time we had our tilting motion. So you can see we have our tilting motion. It's dropping and creating this space that once I get it to this point, our green area in the center, you can see is our Lake Tahoe Basin. And then in my right hand, the west side of our basin. We have the Sierra Nevada mountains in black. And in my left hand, we have in red, our Carson range. And both of those ranges have risen up while that basin has dropped and become lower and has become the area that can fill in with water that is now Lake Tahoe. In addition to our paper model, I want us to take a look at an animation created by some researchers at the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. They do a really fantastic job of helping us understand what's happening in the entire basin and range province. And in that westernmost part where the Lake Tahoe Basin is, you can see actually how that normal faulting, that sliding down of our blocks, at the same time creates rise in the mountain ranges around our basin. Looking at our animation here, this actually shows, as I was saying, the entire basin and range province, that entire swath of land across Nevada, as well as our western edge is the Sierra Nevada. So when we're looking at this animation, I want us to focus on that 
leftmost part and the westernmost part where it's applicable to the Lake Tahoe Basin. The extension and pulling of the earth is actually what's creating these fractures. And you can see them pop up and they're nicely labeled here as our faults. As those faults drop and rise, you can see that the mountains on the west side, on the left side of that basin are rising up as well as the mountain range on the east side of this basin as well. These mountains would be like the Sierra Nevada mountains on the west side of Lake Tahoe, while this other mountain range that's rising up is that eastern Carson range on the east side of our lake. While we see the basin in the middle, and in our animation here, we can actually see how these basins start to fill in with water. Just like Lake Tahoe is filled in with water, looking back at our map here, we can understand now after doing that motion a few times with our hands that our basin is gonna get really, really deep along our Tahoe Sierra frontal fault zone. And those Sierra Nevada mountains are actually gonna rise up and seem even higher. So when we look at this aerial view of Lake Tahoe and we can see down the west shore, we have our really high mountains here that kind of plunge straight down into Lake Tahoe. And because the lake is filled with water now, we can't actually see how steep of a drop off we have along the west shore here. But the west shore does have some of the deepest parts of our lake. But this Tahoe Sierra frontal fault zone along our west shore of Lake Tahoe are not the only fault lines that have created deep parts of the lake. We also have the West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault, our state line fault that runs right along the border between California and Nevada. And then we also have our Incline Village Fault that runs through the town of Incline Village, right where our Tahoe Science Center is in Nevada. And along these faults, similar movements have occurred. If we use our hands, we can see where that movement along the fault will actually create deep parts of the lake as well. And this map shows us how deep the lake is. We can see near Tahoe City, where my cursor is right here, it's pretty shallow and then gets deeper. In the north part of Lake Tahoe, maybe some of you have been to the beaches in Kings Beach before, it's really shallow and you can walk out pretty far before the lake starts to get deeper and deeper. Our map on the right here actually shows us the depth of Lake Tahoe and the elevation around the Lake Tahoe Basin of all the mountains. So you can imagine if the lake had no water in it, the deepest parts of Lake Tahoe are found along these fault lines. And the very deepest part of the lake, which is 1,644 feet deep, is actually off of state line fault, this center fault running through here. And that deepest part is right about here where my cursor is. But Lake Tahoe is filled with water because our basin is a closed watershed and a watershed is an area where all the water drains to one point. And our basin is that point that our water drains to. So there are 63 streams all around the Lake Tahoe Basin that drain into the lake and fill it with water as our snowpack from winter melts or if we occasionally get a rainstorm. All of that water is running into the lake to fill it up with water. But this movement happening along these fault lines, that downward movement creating depth in the lake, are not the only things occurring along these fault lines. Just like we were talking about magma and pressure coming up through the earth that created the Sierra Nevada mountains and a lot of different mountain ranges all over the earth, we can also see magma coming up at these cracks in the earth or these fault lines where there's tectonic activity occurring. So around the Lake Tahoe Basin, there's a lot of really neat rock formations that are not granite. They're a different kind of volcanic rock where these abrupt events, these quick sudden events at the release of energy along our fault lines is causing that lava to be released and a different kind of volcanic rock to be formed. I'm gonna show you all a couple different places around Lake Tahoe that have these kind of volcanic rock formations. And maybe you've even visited some of them before and not even known how cool of a place you've been in. Have any of you ever been to Picnic Rock before? Picnic Rock is off the Spur Trail in North Lake Tahoe. 
um, which you can access off of Highway 267, a really, really beautiful hike. And here you can see the view of the lake in winter with one of my coworkers, Allison's dog, Pepper, so neatly tucked on top of the snow there. Picnic Rock is an example of this volcanic rock. And when we look at our map here, Picnic Rock is located roughly along this northern part of the West Tahoe Dollar Point Fault. Have any of you ever been to Cave Rock before? Cave Rock is located on the east shore of Lake Tahoe and is another example of this volcanic rock and happens along the Incline Village fault line. A third really neat rock formation along the west shore of Lake Tahoe is Eagle Rock. Maybe you recognize this view looking from the west shore across to the east shore of Lake Tahoe. Eagle Rock is really famous and used to have a ton of rock just like it all around it, all along this part of the West Shore. But just as we were learning, the West Shore has a major fault zone. There's a lot of potential for earthquakes to occur along the West Shore of Lake Tahoe. And that's exactly what happened. 50,000 years ago, there was an earthquake that actually caused all of the rock around Eagle Rock to collapse and create a landslide into Lake Tahoe. All of this rock slid across the lake, actually carving out part of the Tahoe City shelf. So looking at our picture here, you can see this area of Tahoe City is actually not as deep as the rest of the lake, but this part of the Tahoe City shelf that got absolutely destroyed by the amount of rock collapsing during our McKinney Bay landslide event, carried all of this rock across the bottom of Lake Tahoe. And looking at this map of Lake Tahoe, we can actually see these pieces in the middle of the lake are massive chunks of rock from the McKinney Bay landslide. Scientists have sent uh, remote controlled submarines to the bottom of Lake Tahoe to actually explore some of these big pieces of rock. But the really crazy event that occurred along with the McKinney Bay landslide was a tsunami in Lake Tahoe. And that tsunami, because we're in a basin, actually forced the water into the east shore of Lake Tahoe, but because Lake Tahoe is a closed basin, it created something else called seiche waves. And seiche waves are water that kind of sloshes back and forth, as if you can imagine sitting in a bathtub and you have a wave. There's nowhere for those waves to escape. This tsunami event destroyed a lot of life everywhere near the shores of Lake Tahoe. You can think about how much water was moved and went up along the shores, but earthquakes and tsunamis are not the only thing that have played a role in the formation of the lake. Have any of you ever been to Emerald Bay before? Or maybe you've recognized this really iconic view of the lake? Well, this part of Lake Tahoe was carved by glaciers. As I was saying earlier, Lake Tahoe was over a million years old, but between a million years ago and present day, we had a massive ice age. And the Sierra Nevada, in a lot of places, used to have an ice field and have a lot of glacial activity. Along the west shore of Lake Tahoe, that Sierra ice field started to carve different parts of the edges of the lake. And the way that scientists can see this and know this is that glaciers carve out a really iconic U shape that you can see here in the Emerald Bay area. It's kind of this big U in our lake. And this map here shows us the way that the glaciers were moving as they melted. And as glaciers move, they carve the rock underneath them. And that's what creates that big U shape. Cascade Lake, which is right next to Emerald Bay, is another area that's been carved by glaciers and carved by the Sierra Ice Field. However, Cascade Lake isn't directly a part of Lake Tahoe. It's connected by Cascade Creek here, which you can see running down to Lake Tahoe and is one of the streams that actually feeds Lake Tahoe. But Cascade Lake has also been carved by a glacier and has that U shape that glaciers are known for creating. So, we have glaciers, we have earthquakes, we have movement along fault lines, we have lava coming out of the earth and creating neat rock formations. We have the formation of the Sierra Nevada with our convergent plates. There's a lot of different forces that have come into play to shape Lake Tahoe into what we know it to be today. We have this really iconic shape that I kind of think looks like a foot. But we also have a beautiful, beautiful lake and a beautiful landscape that we get to call home. 
There's fault movements and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions creating unique rock formations, as well as glaciers carving different shapes of rocks, and even tsunamis that have played a role in the formation of the Lake Tahoe Basin. But there's also other things impacting the way that the Lake Tahoe Basin looks, like our wildlife and our plants, as well as our human activities. To summarize all the complicated geologic topics that we've been covering in our field trip about the formation of Lake Tahoe, I invite you all to go watch the Lake Tahoe in-depth video that's in the PDF under the elaborate section. The whole video is 16 minutes long and covers a lot of different topics about the Lake Tahoe Basin, but in our PDF I've also included timestamps if you just want to watch the segments that pertain exactly to the topics that we've been covering in our field trip here today. So go pause and watch that video and then come back here and we'll recap everything that we've learned and wrap up our formation of Lake Tahoe field trip. I hope you enjoyed getting to watch some or all of that video again. The narrator covers a lot of the topics that we covered in our field trip together. After exploring these topics, I imagine some of that video makes more sense to you now than it did at the beginning of the field trip. Now that we understand more about fault lines and their movements, tsunamis occurring in the basin and what's actually causing that, as well as glacial movement that's carving parts of the west shore of Lake Tahoe. But we covered a lot of information prior to discussing the actual formation of Lake Tahoe. We covered a lot of topics, a lot of geologic processes that go on elsewhere in the world besides just the Lake Tahoe Basin. I want us to review what we've covered in our field trip together because we've covered a lot of information and you all have done a great job following along and exploring these different and pretty difficult to understand concepts. We started off our field trip talking about the layers of the earth. That crust, our outermost layer is really thin and brittle and is broken up into lots of pieces called tectonic plates. The mantle of our earth is really hot and has a complex process going on in it called convection currents that's driven by the heat in the core of our earth. Then we moved on to talking about density. And it was a little confusing at first why we were talking about density and why density is so important to the layers of our earth. Density was important with the layers of our earth because the pieces in our crust and our mantle interact in different ways because of their density. Continental crust or our continental plates are the least dense of all of our plates and our oceanic plates are more dense. So when we started to talk about our tectonic plate boundaries and the way those tectonic plates interact with each other, our continental plate would always want to float on top of our oceanic plate. However, density is not only impacted by the amount of molecules packed into an object. We also got to explore how density is impacted by temperature. We looked at these two different systems to understand how temperature affects density. When we had our first system with warm water on top and cold water on bottom, they didn't mix. Whereas in our second system on the right, when we had cold water on top and warm water on the bottom, they did mix. And our conclusion from this experiment together was that warm water is less dense than cold water. That warm water wanted to rise up and float on top of the more dense cold water. We wanted to understand how temperature affects density because in our mantle of our earth, we have something going on called convection currents. And convection currents are driven by the heated material in our mantle rising up, just like that warm water rose up to take the place of the cold, dense blue water. But as we investigated in a lot of detail, when that heated material rises and expands, it is moving away from the core of the earth, which is providing it its heat. So as it rises, it actually cools off and becomes more dense and wants to sink down again. And that's what drives these circular currents happening in the mantle. And that temperature effect on density and those convection currents happening in the mantle is causing the plates to move. When our tectonic plates move, they interact with each other in a lot of different ways. And we explored those three different ways that tectonic plates can interact with each other. There are some places where two plates come together. We call that our convergent plate boundary. There are places where the two plates are pulling apart, our divergent plate boundary. And then in some places, there are two plates 
sliding alongside one another, our transform plate boundary. We then focused further in on our convergent plate boundary and our transform plate boundary because those were the two plate boundaries that mattered the most when it comes to the formation of Lake Tahoe. Convergent plate boundary was important because that's how it helped to form the Sierra Nevada mountains. Our subduction of our oceanic plate under our North American continental plate forced magma up and created the Sierra Nevada. And those Sierra Nevada make up the western part of Lake Tahoe. Together we watched and made observations about some models showing us earthquakes that are occurring all over the world, starting in 1901 and going through the year 2000. Getting to see all of those earthquakes and make observations, we came to the conclusion that 90% of all earthquakes are occurring on those tectonic plate boundaries. The other 10% of earthquakes are happening along fault lines outside of a plate boundary. Fault lines are a place where the earth is stretching or being pulled apart and creates cracks or fractures in that earth's surface. And fault lines are important because the movement and the tectonic activity along fault lines is what created our Lake Tahoe Basin. Looking closer at Lake Tahoe itself, we investigated each of the fault lines that have played a role in creating the really deep Lake Tahoe Basin. In addition to the movement along the fault lines that's creating the dropping motion and the dropping of the basin to make it deeper, we also talked about the volcanic activity along those fault lines where lava is coming out and creating unique rock formations like picnic rock and cave rock and eagle rock. We also talked about earthquakes triggering landslides and causing a tsunami, as well as glaciers carving out parts of the west shore of Lake Tahoe. And all of these different forces coming together, as we discovered, have shaped Lake Tahoe into the beautiful lake that we know it to be today. And if you're joining me from the Lake Tahoe area, we're really, really lucky to get to call this unique geologic area home. We've covered a lot in our field trip together today. And even though we weren't able to be together in the Tahoe Science Center, I'm glad that you all were able to join me on our journey to understanding how Lake Tahoe formed. There's a couple activities that you all can do if you're interested in exploring any of the topics that we covered further. After participating in our field trip, we would ask that you fill out the student survey that's attached in the PDF associated with our field trip. That helps us gauge how we're doing in our education skills, as well as helps us improve these programs for the future. You can explore density more by doing that density activity in a bucket of water right at home. If you're interested in learning more about the history of plate tectonics and their movement, you can use our Pangea puzzle activity to understand how scientists discovered that the supercontinent Pangea existed one time in Earth's history. If you're interested in earthquakes, you can use some online earthquake monitors to see in real time when and where earthquakes are occurring on Earth. In addition to those activities, UC Davis Turk has some videos about the geology and formation of Lake Tahoe on our YouTube channel if you're interested in learning even more about how Lake Tahoe formed. But for now, thank you all so much for joining us today. We are so glad you were able to join us virtually and look forward to when we're able to be back in our Tahoe Science Center together. <laughs>